list of things to be taken, and a pretty lengthy one it was, before we parted that evening. The next day, which was Friday, we got them all together and met in the evening to pack. We got a big glad stone for the clothes, and a couple of hampers for the whittles and the cooking utensils. We moved the table up against the window, piled everything in a heap in the middle of the floor, and sat around and looked at it. I said, I'd pack. I rather pride myself on packing. Packing is one of those many things that I feel I know more about than any other person living. It surprises me myself, sometimes, how many such things there are. I impressed the fact upon George and Harris and told them that they had better leave the whole matter entirely to me. They fell into the suggestion with a readiness that had something uncanny about it. George spared himself over the easy chair and Harris cogged his legs on the table. This was hardly what I intended. What I had meant, of course, that I should boss the job and that Harris and George should potter about under my directions. I was pushing them aside every now and then with, Oh, you! Here, yeah, let me do it. There you are. Simple enough. Really teaching them, as you might say. Their taking it in the way they did irritated me. There is nothing that irritates me more than seeing other people sitting about doing nothing when I'm working. I lived with a man once who used to make me mad that way. He would loll on the sofa and watch me doing things by the hour together. He said, it did him real good to look on at me, messing about. Now, I am not like that. I can't sit still and see another man slaving and working. I want to get up and supreme tense and walk around with my hands in my pockets and tell him what to do. It is my energetic nature. I can't help it. However, I did not say anything, but started packing. It seemed a longer job than I had thought it was going to be, but I got the bag finished at last. Then I sat on it and strapped it. Ain't you going to put the boots in? said Harris. And I looked around and found I had forgotten them. That's just like Harris. He couldn't have said a word until I got the bag shut and strapped, of course. And George laughed. One of those irritating senseless laughs of his. They do make me so wild. I opened the bag and packed the boots in. And then, just as I was going to close it, a horrible idea occurred to me. Had I packed my toothbrush? I don't know how it is, but I never do know whether I've packed my toothbrush. My toothbrush is a thing that haunts me when I am traveling and makes my life a misery. I dream that I haven't packed it. And wake up in the cold perspiration and get out of bed and hunt for it. And in the morning, I pack it before I have used it and have to unpack again to get it. And it is always the last thing I turn out of the bag. And then I repack and forget it and have to rush upstairs for it at the last moment and carry it to the railway station wrapped up in my pocket handkerchief. Of course, I had to turn every model thing out now. And of course, I could not find it. I rummaged the things up into much the same state that they must have been before the world was created and when chaos reigned. Of course, I found George's and Harris's 18 times over, but I couldn't find my own. I put the things back one by one and held everything up and shook it. Then I found it inside a boot. I repacked once more. When I had finished, George asked if the soap was in. I said, I didn't care a hang whether the soap was in or whether it wasn't. And I slammed the bag shut and strapped it and found that I had packed my tobacco pouch in it and had to reopen it. I got shut up finally at 10.05 p.m. and then there remained the hampers to do.